I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society. Welcome to the Urban Agenda. Joining me today is Fernando Ferrer, uh, the former city councilman, Bronxboro president, and mayoral candidate, who is once again seeking the Democratic nomination for mayor. Welcome to the Urban Agenda. Good to be with you again, David. Uh, one of the things we clearly at CSS are interested in are the issues of the, the poor in the city of New York, what we describe as the unheard third. Mm -hmm. uh, others have described it in other ways. Something that's been coming out that we'd like your comment upon is the incredibly high unemployment rates that seem to be hitting many black and Latino uh, men and women. And in a Ferrer administration, what would you try to do about it? Well, David, currently we're talking about the best of times and the worst of times. Mm -hmm. While people are pounding their chests about the uh, number of new jobs, at the very same moment, 49% of African American men, a third of Latino men are without jobs. And if they're without jobs, they're without a means to support themselves and their families, without hope. What we've got to do is two things. In a city that increasingly is um, dividing along skills lines, and skills are really the pathway into work and gainful employment, uh, living a life with dignity with yourself and your family. First, we've got to develop skills and increase those skills. Second, we've got to enter the capital market business development market by developing, creating small business opportunities and increasing those small business opportunities, growing small business in this city. If we do not have a ready and trained workforce to take those jobs that are going to require a higher skills level in um, not only in the near future but in the present and take advantage of doing business with this city, which is the largest uh, consumer of goods and services anywhere in this region, as well as other people doing business with this city, then we're going to miss the boat in the opportunity to bring a number of people, a larger number of people, into gainful employment. But Chancellor Klein has uh, said repeatedly now that uh, only there are 22 high schools in the city of New York, which are basically all black and Latino in terms of their uh, student body, which graduate nobody. How do we deal with children who have been suffering for so long under Democratic administrations and Republican administrations? That's right. The 22 that graduate nobody right. and the countless others that only graduate a few every year. So how as mayor would you address that? That's clearly a problem of uh, transforma uh, transforming education, uh, coming to grips with uh, you know, allocation, uh, teachers union. How would you deal with that? Well, we've got to keep more kids in school, but we've got to keep more kids in school and in the problem areas, we've got to keep more kids in school with better qualified teachers, less overcrowding. I mean, we're sending kids to high schools that are five and 6,000 kids in a high school where nobody knows anybody. Or we're creating smaller schools while the rest of the uh, schools located in the school building have kids hanging off of chandeliers and sitting on radiators to try to find a seat. Where assistant principals and teachers are intentionally over-enrolling classes by as much as 25 percent with the full knowledge that those kids won't even be there by June. What, we're have, what we've got to face here is a problem of keeping kids in school, giving them a complete and full school experience, giving them the training they need so if they're not immediately or necessarily college bound, they will have an opportunity to find gainful work. And if we don't do those things, in high school and begin that process in middle school, we're going to lose yet another generation of kids. And that is probably the largest mortgage on the progress of this city that I can think of. Where would the revenue come for that kind of change? Do you well, think you need additional revenue to get that done? Or is the CFE decision going to provide that? I, you know, I sit on panels, obviously, for the city council on this. And I'm getting the, the, you know, the feeling, particularly with the governor's attitude, that we may be years away from seeing a dime of that money. Well, as you know, David, I was a party on the lawsuit, and I right. currently sit on the Campaign for Fiscal Equity Board. I right. think that's an important piece of business for the city. And when you point out that this is a problem, school system is a problem going back to Republican and Democratic right. mayors, 
the shortchanging, consistent and chronic shortchanging in the city in terms of education dollars and favoring uh, suburban school districts has been going on for more than 25 years under Republican and Democratic administrations alike. What we're going to have to do here is understand that one, money does help solve some problems. It helps us build more schools. It helps us relieve school overcrowding. It helps us add the kind of after-school programs that gives kids an opportunity to be in front of a caring adult, out of harm's way, and learning more. Finally, it gives us the means to add to our educational program, to get technology in the schools as it is needed. You can't have a computer cart visit from class to class, and by the time they get it all together, those kids are spending at most 10 minutes on a computer. That's a fraud. It's horrible, and it doesn't work. It doesn't educate kids. So money is going to solve a lot of this problem, but will is going to solve the rest of it, too. We've got to come together. Teachers, parents, school administrators, city officials, community-based organizations, often frequently left out of the equation, Bring them in to a new compact on fixing our schools, a new compact on increasing a culture of success in successful schools and creating a culture of success in failing schools. And what is your critique of the current administration? What, what do you see as their failures in this area? Obviously, there was a, a general sense that the mayor's takeover of the schools was going to lead to something. What, what is your sense of how this has gone and what went wrong, or if it's gone right? Well, I'd hoped that that would occur, too. Um, the mayor, I think, did a, a tremendously courageous thing in the very beginning of his, of his administration. He took complete accountability for the school system. He said, measure me on success, and not small success, but significant success. By the mayor's own uh, yardstick, he has failed. But even more importantly, a generation of kids is being failed. And here are the ways. When there was a promise to push down the school bureaucracy and to put more resources in the classrooms. In fact, the opposite has happened. Resources are coming out of classrooms. They're going back into regional offices, into district offices, into Tweed. And in fact, the headcount, the bureaucracy, has grown under this chancellor from the previous chancellor, the old Board of Education. Now, that's not the way to go. We're not building new schools. In fact, the mayor has postponed $1.3 billion in new school construction. This administration has cut $23 million in after-school programs. After they cry crocodile tears about trying to keep kids in, uh, in uh, uh, an environment that is safe and nurturing a little longer during the day, between the hours of 3 p.m. and 6 p.m., so parents don't need to get that horrible call at work that most parents fear, that something has happened to their child. Keep them learning. Give them homework help. Give kids who are having a rough time in school more time on task. They've cut $23 million from that program. Now, that's not moving this in the right direction. In fact, it's moving it in the wrong direction. We did a report recently that just came out uh, that we find that about 170,000 uh, young people in the city of New York between 16 and 24 are disconnected. That means neither in work or in school. How do you reconnect? This, this goes back to a time when we were young, or I was young, where obviously there were a lot of kids. I think kids. it's we. we uh, the fear we're, we're beginning to recognize, uh, we have the highest rate of such disconnect rate that we can find in the nation. And clearly something's going on here. I think part of it may be region standards that are driving who can't, kids who can't make it out, but may be overcrowding. What do we do in terms of reconnecting the young people we've left out? I'm worried, frankly, about a return to the explosion of gang activity yeah. that we've already seen out in California, but I don't, that's a lot of people who don't have any visible means of support. What would you do about the, the youth issues of people who are out of school now and, and drifting? Well, as you know, David, that's what an aggressive after-school program in all of our middle schools and in our high schools is aimed to resolve. Uh, that problem of, and you ask any uh, man or woman who is in our New York City Police Department, any FBI official uh, about after-school programs, and they'll tell you they're the single most important ingredient in keeping kids out of harm's way. But 
we're losing kids not only in high school, we're beginning to lose them in middle school. We're losing them in middle school because middle school is typically overcrowded. We're not resolving reading and other problems in the earliest possible grades. And I'm not talking about a third and fifth grade hold back retention program or a get tough program on eight year olds. What I'm talking about is the earliest possible assessment of reading difficulties and the earliest possible intervention, more time on task, the kind of interventions that we know work, but we're not putting the resources together to marshal them in every school and every community that needs them. And there's no gain saying this one important part. Parents really do need to step up to. We're going to need parents in every community to take a more active hand and an active role in their kids' education, not only in the school, but more importantly in the home. We'll be right back to continue the Urban Agenda. If you're not helping after school programs, you're really helping to take them away. That wasn't very nice. After school programs, wouldn't you rather be helping? We're speaking today with Fernando Ferrer, who is seeking the Democratic mayoral nomination. And back to our discussion, Frank. Good to be with you again. Nice. Um, let me talk to you about housing in the city of New York. Um, we have about 130,000 people waiting to get into public housing in New York. Uh, we've got a crisis uh, in Mitchell Llamas, where now landlords can go to market after their subsidy runs out after 20 years, which is sort of happening almost scattershot throughout the city. And we have, I think even they estimate, a homelessness rate of 36 to 39,000 people. How would you confront this issue as uh, the mayor of the city of New York, if you were to take that role? Well, the final component of that problem is the federal government is cutting back on its voucher program, right. the Section 8 program, yep, absolutely. To, to breach the gap of affordability uh, in private rental housing. We have a crisis of affordability in this city. David, people are being priced out of their own town. And we have a mayor who, I don't know if he doesn't get it, but he doesn't seem to care that he doesn't get it. And housing is one of the most important aspects of his failure to understand what this crisis is all about. A crisis that requires us to build more affordable housing in this city, to keep people in their neighborhoods to let them grow here, to provide for them, perhaps for the first time in their lives, a stable family life so they can raise their families in decency and safety and in dignity. It's going to require our spending our own resources and being creative about how to do it, taking the proceeds of the Battery Park City uh, uh, excess capital and investing it as we had promised to do on three separate occasions mm -hmm. in affordable housing, arguing with the state that they made a promise when they changed the rent laws. They made a promise that they would substantially increase their own commitment to affordable housing. They broke it. And then finally, the federal government. That this mayor has allowed the federal government and President Bush and the Republican Congress in particular to skate on one of the most important housing affordability programs in this country, the Section 8 voucher program, is a downright disgrace. Put all those things together and you begin to see the bubble burst. You begin to see more homeless families and individuals. You begin to see people who are facing evictions at a higher rate. You're beginning to see families who are having to decide, do I pay my rent this month or do I feed my kids this month? There's a crisis of affordability and one of the prime ways we begin to get our arms around it is by promoting affordable housing. Deepened tax incentives for Mitchell Lama housing to keep them in the program, mm -hmm. building more affordable housing, multifamily, as well as uh, uh, private rental housing, 
And getting the federal government to step back in and do what it has traditionally had to do. Now, the, the mayor has committed to tens of thousands of new units of uh, affordable and moderate housing. Do you, do you think that commitment is, is insufficient or, you know, he's not committed to it or it's too long? What is your attitude on, on his current commitment? David, you and I remember a commitment of housing in this city um, that was launched by um, former Mayor Koch. Right. Now, I've had my famous arguments with him, but there is nothing, no arguing this one point. The mayor who made the largest and most significant city-altering commitment to housing in this city was Ed Koch. And we need a program of that scale, magnitude, and depth again. Building a few thousand housing units is very nice, and we appreciate it. But that pales in comparison to the thousands of units we're, uh, we're subsidizing with Liberty Bonds in Lower Manhattan and elsewhere. And it also um, begs the question of why this city and its housing authority have a surplus of 5,000 apartments in every one of our New York City housing authority what is your What is your take on why that occurred? What's going on in your view? I, I simply have no idea why in the midst of an enormous housing shortage and, the, and this problem of affordability, record numbers of people on the waiting list for housing authority mm -hmm. projects, they allow 5,000 units to occur. There can't be that many in construction and in repair. There can't be that many that are so totally uh, unusable that we've forgotten about them. There are 5,000. Let's get our arms around that problem now. Fix them in two to three months and put them at the disposal of the many tens of thousands of people who are waiting for an apartment in our New York City Housing Authority. Now, the mayor and uh, Linda Mills, his commissioner, have suggested a way to try to reduce the amount of homelessness. And uh, she, they have a, a new sort of sub, a different kind of voucher. What do you think of those efforts to try to reduce homelessness? Well, I, uh, I first heard Mike Bloomberg uh, reveal his... Uh, I, what I have to assume is a deeply held belief on homelessness in the 2001 mayoral debate when he said in a city as wealthy as this with so many rich resources it's a disgrace that we have people living on the street that we have families roaming the city in subways I hold him and I measure him by that standard that came out of his own mouth and if that's the standard then I think we've got record numbers of homeless families that require a place to live. I'm glad they're beginning to focus on it. But David, the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and they're still out there. Let's talk about something. This, this is perhaps the weirdest election season uh, I think many of us have ever seen with uh, one issue uh, that's dominating all else, which is the issue of whether New York gets the Olympics and the West Side Stadium. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been a vigorous uh, and outspoken critic of some of the mayor's actions on this. Uh, talk, talk about your position on this uh, West Side Stadium and Olympic bid. Well, it really is simple. Let me separate the, uh, what, something that the mayor declines to do. Separate the stadium from the Olympics. Look, what city wouldn't be proud and happy to host the Olympics? But that's not the issue. And the Olympics should not be used as a Trojan horse to ram this multi-million dollar more than $600 million in public funds, stadium down the throats of New Yorkers. I think the stadium is wrong. There has been such a lack, shocking lack of disclosure and debate on this stadium in the first place. The backroom deals that have been made would make Boss Tweed blush. Second, $600 million in public funds for a stadium. Intentionally suppressing the value of one of the most important important public assets that are still available on the island of Manhattan, the air rights over the rail yards on the far west side. These are things that if you allowed the private market, which everybody says they want the free market to determine what the value of things is, if you let the free market determine what the value of that was, we'd have housing there, we'd have enough money in our transit system so that we'd make repairs to the sea line, We'd make, we'd make it possible so we wouldn't have to raise subway and bus fares and 
tolls on the bridges and tunnels of this city, but even more importantly, we wouldn't be creating the Western Hemisphere's largest traffic jam on the West Side for eight games a year. I think the stadium's a bad deal for this city and a bad idea on the West Side. And my bottom line is, if Woody Johnson and the Jets want to build a stadium for the Jets in New York, build it on your own dime. You pay for it and build it in Queens or wherever you like. But don't expect the public to dig into its pockets. Well, we can't fix our schools, can't fix our potholes, we can't build enough affordable housing. We shouldn't be paying for this and then struggling to find a few nickels and dimes to feed the frail homebound elderly uh, in the Bronx and elsewhere in this city. And what is your response to the mayor's argument that the Olympic Committee has told him that if we don't have the West Side Stadium, uh, the Olympics are, are we're not going to have them? It is interesting that they are making that argument. In fact, it's not the Olympic Committee. It's this one lady from Morocco who, after she was wined and dined in the uh, mayoral townhouse, uh, comes out and says, hey, if you don't get this West Side Stadium, you can't have the Olympics. That's never been the position of the Olympics, never been pos the position of the IOC, and a little suspicious that after getting wined and dined and indoctrinated by the mayor and his people, she comes out with this. It's baloney. Freddie, you and I have been in... I guess, in and around, I, you more actively than I in public life for a long time. Why in the world would you want to be mayor? David, there are people in this city who expect their leader to deliver for them in housing, in public schools, in bringing good jobs to the city, in making a great city better by working well for everybody in New York. That's the only reason I'd want to do this again. Well, I'd like to thank you for spending the time with us. Thank you for inviting me. My thanks to Freddie Ferrer. I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society. And thank you for watching The Urban Agenda. To learn more about the work of the Community Service Society of New York or to comment on the urban agenda, please contact us at 212-614-5425 and on the web at www.cssny.org.